Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, good afternoon. Hello. Hello. Nice to see everybody. Hey, Marco, my video is not showing up, so I'm going to log out and come back in. Be right back. Do a mic check as we're waiting for people to filter. Yeah. Hello. 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 Was that Hello? You, Tony? Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes. Okay. I forgot to introduce new or have new faces introduced last time when I was um, um, whatevering, facilitating. There we go. Maybe we could do that this time. We we did go into it with Tony and Marco after after you had left, but yeah, we can do that again. And it looks like we have someone else, Scarlet Fire. Yes, so can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Hi. So, yes, I'm calling in from uh, Germany. It's uh, 2 a.m. Uh, where I'm calling from. It's, and I'm uh, calling in from a little village in between the border of Bavaria and Austria. It's under a mountain called Wendelstein. You can Google it if you want. Um, and I know this group from, uh, I think it was two years ago, from this um, uh, John Gebster meeting. And uh, I watched the uh, calls and, you know, I come to this Autobindo work through the work of um, Ken Wilber. And um, so, and that's very much how I um, read this book. So I'm... Um, I read this uh, work and the supermind through um, this developmental lens, more or less. And, well, yes, so I'm a student of the work of Ken Wilber, and that's how I more or less came to this, came to this call. Tony, at the Sri Aurobindo Center Berlin, in November, we will be reading Savitri, beginning to end, for five days, if you want to join us. Yeah, I think no November 14th through November 20th or 21st or something. I'm, I'm reading this for the first time. So mm. um, I'm planning to finish, like, with this reading, like, I don't know, this or ne next month. So I, I want to read full um, the full trilogy. Mm. And, um, yes, so. E email me if you want information. Come yeah. to Berlin and join yeah. us. There's, there's, there's so much yeah. going on, I know. Mm. Okay. Are we recording, Marco? Yes, we are. And we can get uh, started. Are we going to meditate? Is someone going to lead the meditation? Are we waiting for somebody? Um, Kim was logging back in. Uh, she, uh, I'm not sure where uh, she's at, but it looks like her video is working. Okay. Uh, and then there was somebody else, Scarlet Fire, who dropped out and has not come back in the last couple of minutes. I think we could get started if there's Kim. Uh,
But John, you'll be leading us today. So would you like to lead the meditation? Um, Matteo, do you have those bells? No? Maybe I do. Oh, I have some bells, yes. Okay. Is everyone ready to relax? So we'll have a five-minute five minute meditation and I'll time it.
So we've read book one. And the first two chapters of book two. And I have um, several ideas for working with this chapter. And I'm really curious about what you guys are coming up with. Um, I just wanted to quote our friend Ed Mahood. Um, he was talking about our group. While I enjoy the Aurobindo sessions, there's much more that's not being said than is being said. And the essence of what the text is about, for example, is not being addressed. I don't think that's an easy thing to do. Maybe it's just me, but I get the feeling that most of us around here come from a more scholarly academic background and that predisposes us to a more intellectual approach, if that's the right way to phrase it. Nevertheless, there is much more in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in any of our philosophies. But not everyone is ready to take that leap of faith into the non-philosophical all at once. I wouldn't want to be the one on the sidelines badgering everyone to jump. And I certainly don't think any of us should <laughs> take that leap <laughs> without thinking very hard about it. Um, so maybe we can develop some of um, our friend uh, Ed Mahood's uh, suggestions here. I also wanted to, to uh, quote um, Sri Aurobindo. Um, he, he seems to be in both of these chapters over and over again presenting these um, paradoxes of the self, paradox of uh, self-reflexive consciousness. And I found this uh, at the beginning of chapter two, he's talking about different kinds of logic. And there's the ordinary uh, rational logic. And then there's also a different kind of language that he's encouraging us to, uh, to, to develop. And I think he draws upon that quite a bit in this text. I'm just quoting him. He's talking about these fundamental uh, truths of this omnipresent reality. In themselves, they are seized directly, not by intellectual understanding, but by a spiritual intuition, a spiritual experience in the very substance of our consciousness. But they can also be caught at in conception by a large and plastic idea and can be expressed in some sort of a plastic speech, which does not insist too much on rigid definition or limit the wideness and subtlety of the idea. In order to express this experience of this idea with any nearness, a language has to be created, which is at once intuitively metaphysical and revealingly poetic, admitting significant and living images as the vehicle to a close, suggestive, and vivid indication. Language such as we find hammered out in a subtle and pregnant massiveness in the Veda and the Upanishads. In the ordinary time of metaphysical thought, we have to be content with a distant indication and approximation by abstractions, which may still be of some service to our intellect, for it is this kind of speech which suits our method of logical and rational understanding. But if it is to be of real service, the intellect must consent to pass out of the bounds of a finite logic and accustom itself to the logic of the infinite. On this condition alone, by this way of seeing and thinking, it ceases to be paradoxical or futile to speak of the ineffable. So I think that's a huge challenge. Um, and I, and to sort of chunk this down and to chunk it more slowly, because um, epistemology is uh, one of those big words like ontology, which you know a lot of non-philosophers, their eyes just glaze over when they hear these words. So I would like to uh, perhaps stage a little bit of this uh, paradoxes of the self um, by doing a little thought experiment. So I appreciate it. Everyone would get, do you have pencil and paper? Because I'm gonna ask you to jot down a few things. So this is a thought experiment. So I want us to sort of uh, be a little playful with this. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions, but before we do that, since we since we now have had some considerable experience reading our bindo, we've done the first book. Um, I would like you to think about three things. 
that you have learned about the life divine. And out of those three things that you're considering, that you've learned about the life divine, pick one that's most significant to you, the learning that's most significant. So I'm just going to ask you a few questions, open-ended questions. You can muse upon them. If something comes up, that's great. If not, that's okay too. So how do you know this learning is most significant? And whereabouts is this knowing? Does this knowing have a size or a shape? And is there anything else about that knowing? And where does that knowing come from? And how old could that knowing be? And that knowing is like what? So just take a couple of minutes. You might want to represent that in a way that makes sense to you. Could be a sketch or a drawing or the words. Some, some way of representing that knowing in a way that makes sense to you. Need another minute? Okay. Take your time.
So I would like to invite you to feel free to share anything that um, you want to share about that experiment. And, um, and if you don't want to share, that's cool too. But I, I would just invite you to consider this as an attractor that uh, you could be moving towards in our conversation here tonight. Um, does anyone want to volunteer to go first? We can, I'm opening this up. So I, I, I don't mind friend. this start out just simply because by the end of your talk there, I, I was reminded of a doodle that I did during maybe three or four weeks ago in which we were talking about catalyzing cosmic community. Um, but this is my image from then. So it just, it has a lot of our names who were present then, some ideas. Um, so this is some sort of cosmic space. Um, but out of the three that I listed, it was the internal realm um, and the infinite possibilities being made tangible. So that, that for me was most significant because it's my kind of my true practice once I get away from work or whatever else is out there. Um, so if I have time to focus on that internal realm, making it tangible, then I, that knowing is available at any location. I can be anywhere at any time and it can be manifest. Um, Oh, I'll stop there. And that self eventually and becomes a cosmic community that I was, we, we tend to talk about here. And that self becomes a cosmic community. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. Who uh, has something different? Well, I'll, I'll share something. Uh, it, 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 I got an idea immediately when you began your series of, of questions. Uh, and then uh, as you continued elaborating on, um, on the theme, uh, I kind of drifted you know, into a more of a... Mm, kind of proprioceptive um, space. Uh, and then when you finally let us go to represent uh, that response to the questions, I very quickly put together a scene kind of came together uh, that was kind of representative. It's, it's a scene. It's, it's um, a number of elements that just came through very quickly. Uh, so, so it's a sketch. I'll I'll just share it there, and it's pretty cartoonish. Uh, this is a, a meditating person, and there's a star, kind of in the gut area. There's a heart. It's radiating. Hair is on fire. Uh, there's um, a mushroom cloud, bolt of lightning, a flower, a sun that's hashed and a dragon coming out of uh, the earth, which is kind of going down like that uh, with worms in it. Okay, a, a dragon out of the earth with yeah. worms in it? Yeah. And a meditator with a heart and a star in the gut and hair on fire? Mm -hmm. And is it a bolt of lightning? It is. Uh, oh, there's a bird. And a, a pathway, I think. I was going to put, I was going to put a little girl running or playing or something happening in the background. I may not have gotten to it. And what are, what are you most drawn to in that drawing? Right, I think the dragon. Actually, mm -hmm. the dragon seems to be in my face. It seems to be arising uh, 
right before me. Thank you. And I, is this um, intuitively, um, at once intuitively, metaphysical and revealingly poetic, admitting significant and living images? This, I believe, is um, Aurobindo's encouragement to us. So thank you for taking that wherever you want to go with it. So does anyone else have something different they want to share? Or something similar? So I think that um, uh, reading this book, reading the first book, um, I have a few ideas of what he was trying to do. And I'm um, trying to, um, you, know, um, you know, follow this, uh, follow what he wants to do with this vision. And um, there are a lot of pictures, that are a lot of ideas that come up, but, um, you know, one, um, uh, one thing that happened to me while reading the book was that I, um, I looked at, let's say, a plant, or I looked outside of the window, and um, I, had, I had this idea of Kantianism, you know, that, you know, the whole world, the whole world is one system, I'm a part of the system, and I could look at, let's say, a plant outside of my window or inside of my house, and I could see it as a living, living being, just like um, everything else. And um, you can come to this through uh, reading his book. And that's just one of, one of many ideas. And when I, when I um, try to picture, you know, um, how I come to this, you know, it's pretty much like asking, like, uh, how do you picture God? Like, it's, how, how would you picture, uh, what's your idea of God? I mean, every, everyone would come up with some, something else. Um, so, you know, just it's infinitely, you know, it's infinitely um, simple. It must be so simple that, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to make any picture. So what I do, what I did is just do one big circle and it's basically light or emptiness or, you know, just, just, you know, it's just, just what is. And um, everything is ar arising between, um, you know, space of uh, our own perception and the world. And you can't capture this. It's infinitely simple. So, and that's, that's just one aspect. Other, other people have other pictures, but that's what comes up for me. Thank you. I'll share this. Um, I don't know if you guys can see this. It's like a, a Kinesa triangle. You see the circles have been cut into. And there's a way of looking at it so that the, the triangle appears. It's kind of a pop-out effect. And I believe this uh, text sort of reminds me of this. Of course, you're not, there is no triangle there. But you do see a triangle hovering there. So in a way, there are two different logics that are being uh, employed at the same time so that you can get this pop-out effect. But if you if you just count the sides of the triangle, you'll you'll quickly lose the sense of the pop out effect. So you can use one logic or the other, and either a logic or you can use a both and logic. And for me, this is like that magician, craftsman, 
when Banerjee was uh, talking about the overmind, the ban, and he talked about that, the descent, and the descent as the overmind descends, there's a splitting up and a fragmenting into different performers and different kinds of performances and different kinds of logic. And that is on the way down, but on the way up, as you ascend, we have to deal with that, uh, those, the, that, um, the logic of identity, that classical idea that the, the, of the excluded middle and that identities are maintained by excluding. Um, and this is, I think, what happens as we ascend and we confront this master magician maker who, who creates all these different logics. There's a kind of reversal that happens so that we can enter into the cosmic mind where uh, there are many different kinds of logic that uh, can be entertained the same, at simultaneously. Um, so I think that Aurobindo is, so for me, this helps um, sort of get a handle uh, as a sort of kinesthetic perceptual person on what he, uh, he could be talking about. He's talking about these, these cosmic levels of mind that we have access to. But once we have access to them, that's great, but we can still use, uh, you know, a certain kind of dualistic logic in order to, to function socially. But, but an aspect of our nature is no longer identified with those, that kind of a logic. So this is my uh, attempt at dealing with um, some of this material. Um, and I think this kind of metaphorical mind is what I believe he's entertaining here um, when he's talking about a, a different kind of language. Um, and we could, you know, I could go further in this, into this, but I think I'll, I'll just pause and let other people uh, explore this who are probably much more informed about um, classical ontology than I am. But I think we're, uh, I think that's what he was sort of confronting. Uh, and I can actually, I can quote him again, unless someone has something they pressing they want to share. Um, where I think he, um, he's looking at this classical ontology where there are these immutable laws that, um, and there's these symmetries and that, um, the, the, the personal is less real than the impersonal. Um, and I think that he's, he's inviting us to think differently when he's talking about indeterminates and cosmic determinations. And there's one passage that I thought was interesting. Oh yeah, he's talking about, I think he's talking about emergence. He talks about, I'm not gonna quote him in full because it's such a long paragraph, but he talks about how I, oxygen, hydrogen make water. So emerging out of the, those two elements, water emerges, which is something new. Um, he also talks about how the seed develops into a tree. Um, he also talks about genes and chromosomes and hereditary transmissions. But he's, he's also talking about all of these natural processes, the play of electrons, of atoms, and the resultant molecules of cells, glands, chemical secretions, and physiological processes manages by their activity on the nerves in the brain of a Shakespeare or Plato to produce, or could be perhaps the dynamic occasion of the production of a Hamlet or a symposium or a Republic. But we fail to discover or appreciate how such material movements could have composed or necessitated or necessitated the composition of these highest points of thought and literature. So he's sort of saying, you know, there's no materialist explanation so far for how a, a, a Hamlet or the Republic emerges out of, uh, you know, chemistry and um, physics. So I think that he's sort of, um, he's sort of challenging, I think, those, those classical ways of thinking about reality. And I think he's also inviting a different kind of uh, epistemology as well, as he draws upon a different tradition, the Upanishads and the Veda, which of course I, I'm not very familiar with. So I'm learning, making little baby steps, trying to figure out these uh, Sanskrit terms. So, thank you.
Maybe I can share my way and my method, so to speak, of how, how I read Sri Aurobindo. Not only Life Divine, but every uh, of his writings. Also the Life Divine, because the point is that people uh, frequently say that the Life Divine and also other of his writings are very are hard to understand, but I think uh, we, we must not, but this is after all what you already <clears throat> tried to make clear. In fact, I'm just trying to rephrase <laughs> what you already said. Um, I think it would be a mistake to try to understand Sri because then it means that we are still working with the mind. We say, I mean, uh, analytical mind, a dividing mind, a, a mind that fragments everything and uh, sees only one truth and only black and white. Whereas, and, and being someone who is very intellectual, I know <laughs> what it means to have such a problem. Um, my usual attitude when I read Sri Aurobindo is how to speak, how to say, mm, how, how can I say, is to step back a bit, step back with my mind and, and not try and, and, and I'm not trying to understand them. I just read and see if there is, so to speak, a light that flashes on or not. Uh, I try to, I even try, don't try nothing. I just simply read and wait, so to speak. And then usually something resonates. There's a sort of resonance. Huh? And you say, ah, it's a typical aha uh, experience. Huh? But when you try to rationalize it and to um, categorize uh, the concepts, in concepts, in meanings, in intellectual analytical concepts, what he is uh, saying. Well, you can also do this until a certain degree, but you can't go beyond that. So I think normally uh, w when people get a sort of headache <laughs> when they read so Bindo, probably they are have not, have not having the right attitude. You must, I think, I, I got this habit to just step back and see. And sometimes nothing comes, nothing, there is no resonance. Okay, then I say, let's go over again to the next phrase, to the next chapter, to the next book or whatever. Uh, but it, it's difficult to describe. It's, it's already... I think a little uh, first step uh, towards what he say he used to uh, um, exp he used to say used to um, he he called it the um, not the intuitive mind the higher mind because after mind there is a higher mind intuitive mind illumined mind uh, and then. No, first was intuitive, then illumined, and then the overmind, and finally supermind. As humans, it, I think it would be nice already to make the first step into the direction of the um, higher mind. But contrary to what we might believe, the higher mind is not that trying that it gives up this uh, attempt to understand. Uh, it is a sort of uh, mental surrendering uh, where some intuitive flash comes through. And when you read Sri Aurobindo, I think this is, for me, it's the most effective way. And then a lot of things that otherwise are mm, difficult to understand become crystal clear. Uh, that's uh, at least my experience. I don't know how much this relates also for others. So my experience is that the higher mind, your thought becomes 
self-referential. That means kind of you're mir mirroring yourself somehow and something like cognitive biases become very obvious at that point because your picture of the world is so big that you know it takes so many factors into account that linear logic uh, breaks apart. And I think someone like, um, uh, well, there are other people in this in this call uh, that probably could uh, explain this better. It's basically what's what's called post. Uh, what is it? Post. Um, uh, post formal, post conceptual, whatever. So I, I, I share this. Uh, I share this uh, notion of, you know, at some point it really, you know, kind of bre breaks together, and you can't, you can't, uh, you, you can't grasp it anymore. Yes, I, I I like your 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 what you say co cognitive bias uh, that becomes apparent. <laughs> That's my experience too. Uh, one of these the, the these side effects, so to speak, uh, are also that suddenly I realized my preconcepts and said, ah, obviously something it become it becomes an something obvious immediately without thinking, but at the same time, uh, it needs also sort of intuitive discrimination. And discrim because if we don't uh, have some, or we don't practice uh, also um, a post-logic discrimination, uh, we might confuse things. But if we step a little bit out of this linear logic, these cognitive biases uh, become apparent, and it was this. Uh, sometimes it it hurts <laughs> because sometimes uh, one realizes some one owns preconcepts and false thinking that becomes obvious immediately, like in a flash of light that exposes yourself and says, "Oh, okay, I now I've learned the lesson." Perhaps. But it's also a clearing. It's also, it's more clear. So I think yeah. the higher you go, in a certain way, it gets, um, you know, it's, it's a more direct perception of what is. And um, it's closer, in a sense, to, uh, to nature. It's closer to whatever is around you and what, whatever is going on. But it's also, you know, that's it's also beyond uh, beyond what you can grasp in a sense. But it's, you know, a, a more holistic, a more direct holistic perception. So that's how I would, I would describe it at the higher higher minds or illumined minds or whatever his his words were. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I agree. I think <clears throat> taking pleasure in paradox, I think, would be one of the signs that a person may be working in this, uh, with, their, with our, Sri Aurobindo's ultimate project, rather than trying to iron out all the wrinkles and trying to uh, get rid of all the paradoxes. Um, I'm reminded of uh, Gregory Bateson. He was a biologist, anthropologist, but he also was a, very much into epistemology. And since this, this second book is supposed to be focusing our attention on epistemology, I remember once he said, uh, he offered a, the, a classic syllogism, which I wrote down, man is mortal. I don't know if you can see this. Socrates is a man. Socrates is mortal. Sort of a classic, uh, a classic sort of syllogism. But then he said, grass dies, 
man dies, man is grass. And Bateson was pointing out, this is the way nature thinks. Um, and it, it's pretty obvious, it's the way most poets think, think too, probably they had a lot of schizophrenics as well, because <laughs> it's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's using metaphor. So I think these are, uh, I think this is what he's encouraging us to do. And, he, and of course, our, Sri Aurobindo was a, a poet as well. Um, so he was able to go into these imaginal realms and entertain um, multiple perspectives and identities. Um, and he could also, you know, work as a, as a philosopher as well. So I think, but I think there's a great uh, appreciation for the concrete. Um, and for, you know, being able to, to go back and forth, oscillate between the con concrete and the abstract is very important. Um, and not to get stuck in either one. Too much abstraction or too, too much concrete. But I think he has a great res respect for, um, you know, the touching and the feeling and, the, and those attuning to very subtle feels, as we've been talking about in previous meetups about the subtle subtle realms, because I think this is where most of his insights he's drawing upon in a very direct way. Oh, and another thing, I, another thing Bateson said that I liked about nature, the way nature thinks. He held up his hand and he said, if you were a plant, how many fingers? And, you know, the class said, well, I don't know, five. And he said, if if you were a plant, you wouldn't be counting. You would be paying attention to the relationships between the digits. So I think that's another kind of suggestion about how we might entertain how ordinary. I think it was something someone previously said. I think it was you, Tony. I was just looking at a plant on a windowsill in a, in a shaft of sunlight. It's all there, you know. It's it's just that simple, and. Um, I, I believe, of course, we're, we are aspects of that nature. And um, I think when we get alienated is when we get sort of trapped in these contrived um, logics that um, cut us off from that, that field or get us stuck in our heads so that we're cut off from that. So I, I, I believe when I'm enjoying this text is when I am letting go and sort of like, I take notes and I under, underline large sections of this, but for me, it's a very, I think I mentioned this earlier, kind of musical experience. It comes in waves. And um, I sort of just let myself enjoy it. And if I get stuck somewhere, I just like skip over it and come back to it later. <laughs> Bateson's uh, Men Are Grass reminds me a little bit of uh, Pascal's Man is a Thinking Read. Um, but it struck me when I was thinking about the formulation there, it's not, there's nothing really illogical or post-logical or non-logical about the thought that is expressed there. Uh, men are like grass uh, in the sense that they are mortal and they are vulnerable and uh, any number, you know, and anything else that that particular analogy or, or metaphor suggests. So, you know, when you formulate it as a deductive syllogism, sure, it doesn't go through. Uh, it's, it's illogical, but the, but the thought itself is not at all illogical. It seems to me to be fully intelligible. And so it doesn't seem to me to be a very good example of going, of the need to go somehow go beyond logic or, um, you know, into another logic. And it seems like I just use my ordinary logic to understand it, what's similar and what's different about these cases. Well, maybe I'm a little off topic here. I'm still back on the three parts. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I had three parts because it feels to me like our Obindo's work all integrates all the way up and all the way down. But the pieces that, that have intrigued me always with our Obindo is he, and it's a very, uh, one part that's very, almost a hidden and just kind of he suggests it along the way, but it is all the way along the way. He talks about static and dynamic 
And that to me is a very critical part of, of his experience. Uh, the static being more of the, of, uh, he talks about it in, you know, under overmind and some of these later levels of development. He talks about that it's that silence that is always behind all of that. So static is like the timeless and the boundless. So space and time seems to kind of come together and, and it's just still. It's just very, very still. And then he's got the dynamic, and the dynamic seems to have trajectories of all kinds. And these trajectories seem to kind of repeat themselves in these repeating patterns. So he has matter, life, and mind, and that's the whole universe. Everything we know is either matter, life, or mind in these big categories that he puts together. But then he overlays that onto man with the physical, the vital, and the and and mind, and um, and and so we just see these kind of uh, repeating patterns, the involution and evolution, well, uh, which in which there are are either involuting trajectories or evolutionary trajectories and then holding that all is this silent uh static uh spaceless timeless boundless holding field of some kind and and so my experience um, of all of that, just putting that all together, is that that the, the static and the active actually start coming together. And as we go up the stages, I mean, one of the things I admire so much about Aurobindo is he's the only sage I know that actually talked about developmental levels. You know, he he has developmental levels all the way up and all the way down, and he focuses a lot on on higher mind, illumined mind, intuitive mind, overmind, super mind, and then at the end there's an Ishwara or a uh, you know a, a transition into a greater process that goes beyond human beings. So um, you know, my sense is that he is is weaving all of these things together and there are so many definitions and terms that you can get lost in the details and and not stand back and see how the dynamic and the stillness or the static actually weave together the dynamic being all these trajectories and the stillness actually being you know uh you know that that uh a timeless, boundless process that makes it our lives a spiritual kind of experience, and that he's not separating those. He's showing us how they, how they, how they dance with each other, and how they become more and more uh, connected, and how they become each other, and eventually, and, um, and how those very two processes of dynamic and static can come together in just matter alone and then how it come, can come together in matter and life and how it can come together in matter, life, and mind and perhaps continue to come together, uh, um, you know, in a, a infinity, uh, I mean, a t- forever, um, which is actually the more dynamic part of of the and the other side of of the stillness and the the uh, timeless and boundless. So that's it's experiential aspect I've gotten out of it. Uh, I love the details that Aurobindo has, but but when I stand back and just sit in the whole of what he's trying to say, the whole universe is included in our individual selves. And these selves burst open over and over again until we meet that place at supermind or later where there isn't a separation between static and dynamic. It's all just one big blessing. That's what it means to me.
Could you Wonderful please? summary, Terry. Thank you. Um, could someone maybe explain our Windows notion of involution? Because I know there are different uh, versions and different ways of. Uh, I think Marco can explain that. Yes. Can't you, Marco? Don't you think? Which Marco? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> How many Marcos? Oh, we have Marco. Maybe you can explain it too, Marco. <laughs> Which Marco? Maybe we both uh, can explain it, or neither. <laughs> or, yeah, I'd, I'd like Marco to explain it. <laughs> I want Google. anyone to explain it except me. <laughs> I volunteer all of you. <laughs> Please, it's a great topic, but I it's a strenuous one for me. I, I'd like to actually, uh, right before touching that, there's a couple of connections I'd like to make, if I may. Please. Uh, uh, Terry's analysis really reminds me of, uh, I don't know if it's the, I think it's the fifth verse of the Isha Upanishad that says, uh, that moves and that moves not, that is far and the same is near, that is within all this and that is also outside all this. It's just such a lovely play of logic toggling in and out. It's so poetic. And this, uh, this passage that John started us off with, is, it's, it's always been so beautiful to me because Sri Aurobindo fulfilled that passage by composing Savitri. He, he wrote the language that... Uh, that allows us, he, he used the, the mantric language through story that allows us to come in contact with uh, these beings that are correlates of the planes of consciousness and the parts of our being. And there's way too many beings to count in Savitri. I mean, there, there are the main ones. And he gives, he writes an author's note to Savitri that kind of spells that spells out the spiritual significance of the main characters, but there's myriad characters and all the different, uh, the, the, one, of, one of the characters that makes me laugh is the, the, the name that he gives the being that represents vitalized mind. He calls the hunchback rider on the red wild ass. <laughs> Oh, I can't remember what I think that's in kingdoms and godheads of the greater mind. But also, and then Doug was talking, he, Doug used the word um, tangible quite a number of times. And it also ties in with thing, other things that people have been saying, including John's drawing. The, his, Sri Aurobindo's definition for yogic consciousness is the invisible force producing tangible results both inward and outward is the whole definition for yogic consciousness and then he goes on this is in a letter he goes on to describe all of the different ways that he just lists like 15 different ways to measure that in uh in real time and yeah this uh this this chapter um brahman Purusha Ishwara, Maya Prakriti Shakti. Wow, it's there. There's some par paragraphs that are Upanishadic. The uh, one that um, he writes about the play of he and she Ishwara Shakti, and uh, he does this also in Savitri, and it's so beautiful. But in uh, in that that paragraph in this this second chapter, uh, just. Uh, it just stops me. I, I have, I, I honestly feel like I was blessed in not being born with a first class mind. So I, I'm able to turn my mind off. I've never been an academic. I've never desired. I had, I know nothing about classic classical ontology. And <laughs> it's not that I, I really appreciate the mind and I love the intellect. And, um, but I think, uh, I think I, I'm able to quiet my mind. I'm able to quiet my mind 
perhaps easier. I don't know how to compare these things, but I don't think I could read Sri Aurobindo any other way than with a quiet mind. And he talks about this a lot in letters also. The, the um, uh, Maybe I'll try to dig up this one letter and share with everyone where he talks about philosophers and the difference between writing, writing with a quiet mind and the difference between like single pointed concentration and having flow come from that, which he is talking about the process of a lot of philosophers. Um, yeah. Anything else that, Oh, my, John, my uh, drawing was, I just started doodling after you. Can you uh, and you it, it? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. It, it it was. I started like an eye of Sauron, but not from Mount Doom, and it was kind of like an indicator of. I was trying to draw the soul, and then there's like an embryonic thing that was taking place inside. I was just kind of doodling and sensing, sensing this, tr- trying to sense the psychic being, and yeah. I love the I love uh, games like this that take us out of the mind and uh, games and imagination are so key to to uh, getting me into into my heart too. I kind of play uh, I play little games to get my mind to go quiet and and try to center be be as heart centered as I possibly can at at any at any any time I can remember. Yeah, I love, um, you know, sketching on a cocktail napkin, you know. Sometimes great ideas come through that way when you least expect it. So I sort of wanted to invite that part of our nature to sort of feel relaxed about coming forward. Because I get I get very caught up in the, in the logic part, and I think I get uh, sometimes a little distracted. This this chapter, both these first two chapters is like training for the logic of the infinite. He offers us so many. And, and there's also an essay called uh, All Will and Free Will, where he's kind of posing, saying that this this argument with with philosophers is a little nonsensical, saying, is it is it free will or destiny or for free will or fate and what's governing? And he always positions like all free will being a subset of the infinite all will one is logic of all will is uh law just really simplified all will is uh is the logic of the infinite free will is the logic of the finite determinable he kind of starts sinking into that and he also bring starts bringing us in there's so many things that he introduced in these first two chapters he introduced the gunas without naming them by name the different modes of prakriti the different modes of nature rajas tamas sattva he didn't name them but he's bringing he's starting to bring he's starting to bring us into it there's so much that comes up in these first two chapters that he'll just be developing kind of offshoots of of everything from here forward these are two of my favorite chapters in the whole in the whole book i'd like to talk a little bit more about logic uh and this infinite logic or logic of the infinite because he distinguishes that from a finite logic. And I think that there may be a correlation between the different kinds of mind that he um, describes, the kind of intellectual mental mind and then the higher and then higher than higher minds. I think they, they may have different logics, logics and also different ways of knowing when something is logical or not. Because even if you turn off that intellectual mind, the mental mind, in reading this text, I think that there is still a logic that you're following with perhaps the higher mind. And that logic makes it such that uh, the words are not random. Like it's, it's, there's, there's, um, um, there's actually a form that that he's following. There's there's patterns that he's un, unfurling. And if if he were to suddenly mix up Purusha and Prakriti, for example, as as these two aspects, uh, or 
the Saguna and the Nirguna Brahman, uh, if you're following the logic, you would notice an error, I think, in something would feel off. It wouldn't make sense. Because I think that when one is reading this and following the logic, it's also a seeing of the um, realities that, that he's describing. So there's something happening epistemologically when one is reading where I think uh, the text kind of confirms or um, articulates uh, an experiential or a perceptual um, uh, you know uh, just aspect I, I think of the of the of the of the text or a logic so I'm, I, w- I would like to maybe tease that out a bit further because um, Frederick commented on the syllogism and said that it's a it's a logic like any logic but I, I I wonder if it's something a little bit different or if we could maybe more add some more nuance to well, it's a, actually I think you said it was the man is grass isn't a simile that's a metaphor it makes us probably makes very little difference but I think it's I think it's a very different kind of way of operating than this other syllogism. And I'm just bringing this up because I think these are, uh, these are classic statements. And um, I, th- I think that when we get into the non-dual, I think we are more and more comfortable with this. I think the, this syllogism, which comes out of Aristotle, was around for thousands of years. This is about all there was, this kind of logic. Now, of course, we have paraconsistent logic and Grand Priest is coming up with many different kinds of logics. And there's a whole, you know, a lot of uh, people don't want to, you know, go into include the excluded middle. They're very freaked out that there'll be just a total chaos. So I just, um, I mean, I'm not a logician or, come from that background at all but I've read enough of Plato and I've I've read enough of these uh, classical uh, formulations the way they think and I know I know what Rabindo does too but I think he's trying to do to set up something that's an alternative alternate ways of knowing that he wants to sponsor in himself and in the reader and he's sort of making the expectation that you're going to go go with him in that direction, um, and, I, and that's probably a, why he's emphasizing the poetic in that that brief passage that I quoted. And there are many other passages that are pretty much like that. But he seems to be going over and over again. He seems to be staging these paradoxes. There's this, and there's that, and there's this, and there's that, and there's neither this nor that. <clears throat> and so there's like a an either or, which is contained within a both and, which is in, contained within a neither nor. And I believe he's being very porous with all these different kinds of logics. Anyway, I, I wanted to support you in that in, uh, project, I mean, Mark. I mean, it could be just a terminological problem that I'm having here. I, the idea that, uh, it's you know to, the, to use metaphors is to somehow go beyond logic. Just uh, seems a, like a bit of a leap to me. There's nothing illogical about a metaphor. Of course, you can't take metaphors literally. Um, exactly. You know, logic is really just the uh, so so. If what if what Arbindo is really saying is not we have to get beyond logic, which seems to me to be just a non-starter. If he's saying we can't we can't take everything literally. And we can get lots of insights into the world if we take them metaphorically and poetically rather than literally. I don't. I can't imagine anybody arguing with that. Um, it seems true to me, but it doesn't seem particularly um, controversial. Um, but um, uh, you know, really, the study of logic is really just the study of intelligibility. Uh, but, obviously, there are many ways of making sense of things, of making them intelligible. And deductive syllogisms are one, and induction is another, and so on. But so are so is metaphor, so is analogy. 
I, I mean, I presume that when one experiences the supermind, um, that's in some sense, it's an experience of intelligibility. It's an experience of things making sense in some way, or am I wrong about that? Well, I've had certain experiences that I would call very non-ordinary, telepathic experiences, synchronistic events, telepathy with animals. Um, and I've also had, um, I've accompanied people uh, in that border, that borderland between, I would have been with people when they've died. And I've had messages um, after they've died. And I've asked them, and I, in, in the lucid experiences, you know, I'm very aware my body's asleep, but my mind is awake. And I'm not located in the, the laws of the physical. It's a, I'm not saying it's free of laws or, see, or ha, what I call habits, actually. But they're very different. There's no gravity. You can float or fly. Or you can walk. You can create things with your mind. And I've had many experiences of, of uh, others, some pleasant and some unpleasant. But I've often asked, who are you? And I've got many different answers. I've also asked, um, I've also been told, very curiously, and I think I've reported this um, before, uh, I, I've asked, who are you? And the response is, I am you. And my confusion, how can you be me? It's, a, it's a logical. It's logical. Something illogical is being offered to me. And one entity I asked this of, he said, and he paused. And I could tell he was consulting with others. Because I, I think he wanted to come up with something that would make sense to me. And he did. He said, we share the same heart. And I went, oh. And that to me registered in a somatic I guess uh, Orbinda would call vital, um, a somatic kind of intelligence that we shared. Um, and that made sense to me. I mean, the heart can handle multiple personalities. Um, but I think our, uh, our culture, the one we're in, where I'm separate from you and we have an indi we're individuals that are discrete and separate, um, can create logics that I believe are um, inhibit us from experiencing the, the spectrum of consciousness, which I believe is what he's tracking in this book. So I'm just offering that. I think that's what he's talking about. I think he's talking about the relationship between very subtle levels of mind, which are very experiential. And yogis, yogis spend lots of time talking about these different levels. <laughs> but I think most of us in you know suburban cities running around with our with our devices, you know, we don't have contact as often, I think, with these. And, and I think they were more grounded than we were, than we are now. You know, probably they had to do other things besides meditate all day. They had to go dig a ditch or plant, a, plant something. So I think these are the kind of conundrums we moderns and postmoderns have. Um, so that's where I think he's coming from. I think he's coming from these altered states of consciousness, altered states of consciousness according to whom, you know, at certain levels of consciousness, these are not altered states anymore. You know, you get to the cosmic mind and these subtle levels of cosmic mind. Um, the whole notion of identity, of a subject-object divide has disappeared. And our language does not accommodate that unless it's a very poetic language, like metaphor and simile, alliteration and assonance, you know, those, and rhythm pulse, those kinds of somatic experiences may, are very coherent in a way that I think, anyway, I, I may have been talking too much, but I'm just trying to share with you my own perplexity with working with these subtle levels that I think Those are, could be also pre-logical. I mean, he was a yogi. That's mostly what he was doing, like Banerjee said. And that's where he's, I think he's coming from. I'm sorry, didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. They could be pre-logical. Yeah. yeah. So okay. I think logic is more or less, you know, either this or that. It's, um, um, you know, if you do this, then this outcome will happen. And, uh, you know, it's in the boundaries of the mental and it's in, in the boundaries of language and science. And language and science have certain limitations and you could go beyond those limitations 
but I wouldn't call this logic. I wouldn't call. I would call it intuition. Right. And um, the intuition probably has a structure, and there's a structure to higher forms of intuition. And you could call that logic if you want, but you know, it's not. Um, it's not. Uh, you know. I, I I think there's that a trans- conscious logic, like, uh, and it's not in the forms of, uh, mm, you know, this, this, if this, then that, you know. Right. I think there could be a trans logic that sort of corresponds to some sort of uh, trans individual. And you have, may have a pre individual, an individual, and a trans individual all happening simultaneously. Did you all make it to the third to the last or fourth to the last paragraph of this chapter where he goes into detail describing, he doesn't name it, but it's called Tri Kala Drishti, three times vision and past, present, future. I don't, it's in the last five paragraphs, huh? And then he also talks about, huh? Can you read that? Do you have uh, it? I don't uh, <clears throat> I don't know if I marked it out. It's long, John. It's like incredibly long. Not, not the triune <clears throat> being, that part. I'm sorry? Not the triune being. Yeah, but he starts talking about seeing past, present, and future simultaneously. Right. It's called Trikala tri Drishti and then Trikala Shruti, where he's he's able to receive auditory signals that aren't lodged in time and where space is taken on a different texture and tying back into what Marco, I don't know your last name, Marco, not Masi. Morelli. Marco, what Marco Morelli was uh, kind of getting out there. <clears throat> there it, it's, it's so oversimplified to say logic of the finite logic of the infinite. And it's it's also wrong, as Frederick pointed out, he, Sri Aurobindo is not calling all these different terms logic, but the, like he, he starts bringing it out. There's a different form of consciousness in the material realm. There's different, he, he, they're called lokas, they're different worlds. Uh, the vital, the prana loka, the prana worlds are very different than the, the material worlds. And the and he they're they're further divided in what Debashish was talking about last week though, or two weeks ago the commentaries on the Kena Upanishad he details all the different uh, different different types of consciousness just in normal waking mental consciousness apprehending consciousness he's brought up and talked about uh, prajna prajna. Um, consciousness, but there's also different different uh, types that he details. I think well enough for any of us to to access and start considering in in our practice. Uh, it's taken me myriad passes through these passages, but there's also correlates in the five pranas. So life life consciousness is also has different types of. Uh, I don't know if logic is the right word. I want to use that word, but it's not. I appreciate what Frederick said. It's not. It's not quite right. But there's there are five five different broad lines of movement of the of the pranas, and these also have all soul correlates too, and sheath correlates. They're called koshas, and then there's the five purushas that are all kind of soul correlates of these different these different realms. Someone could probably make a map of all this stuff. I'm sure people have have I tried. That, huh? I think that's what he was doing. And when mm. people work with their energy centers, I think most people do when they study meditation or yoga, so it introduces some sort of maybe watered down versions of tantra. But I think mm. if you just do a little bit of that, you can start uh, contacting big energy flows. And I believe that they, uh, the mother and or Bindo were inviting people to uh, let that happen and to stabilize, because uh, they they acknowledged you know it can blow blow people blow people's fuses. So um, people and they, then 
people so in I, Pondicherry in the 1960s were having some extreme psychic breaks. People's fuses were being really blown. Yeah. As well as there's, yeah, the, the history of the ashram there is really quite interesting. I won't go into it now. I feel a little bit like a dog with a bone on this logic question. <laughs> because I think that I think that we're talking about slightly different things, perhaps, and it would be helpful to um, add, add, add the nuance. And I think I've, I've got a way to do it. Uh, when that first syllogism, Socrates is a man, all men are mortal. Uh, I think that we could define it as a symbolic logic. And the way that we know something is symbolic logic is that you could teach a computer to do it. A computer could follow the steps. It could follow an algorithm and come to the same, to the, to the conclusion. I think that, you know, the word logic comes from logos and logos has a mystical provenance that, I, that would be closer perhaps to Aurobindo's concept of uh, the determining force. Uh, I think also associated with the Purusha. Uh, and, and so where I, why I think this is relevant is that when we drop the mind and we enter into other ways of knowing or other ways of reading the text, I don't think we're dropping logic per se. Uh, I think that other forms of that let's say, primal, primordial, determining, shape-giving, form-giving, sense-giving um, force uh, is what we're experiencing. Uh, and so I th it's, that's clearer to me now that we've talked about it a, a, a little bit and I've had, had the chance to, to kind of chew on it. But, so, but, so what about involution? Is there a relationship between that and involution? Well, well, I think so. I, I think I think so in the sense that you could derive more limited logics from the more uh, infinite logics. Uh, like each limited logic is an, is a further determination, is a narrower determination of, of of an infinite logic, and you have to pres like you don't just have to the, the the infinite logic is prior. So that's why this view of reality is so radically different than a materialist view of reality because the materialist would get to the infinite logic from the finite logic from the sim from the symbolic would try to build to more and more complex forms of of, of logic more and the involutionary view says that the infinite is there from the beginning uh, so it's a totally different uh, um, derivation. It's it's really flipping it inside out, and that's what I think is so so radical. What I've been um, most paying attention to in the text, or what's becoming most apparent for me, um, and I noticed the whole section on time at the end, which was very interesting. It's it seemed almost like a should be another section or chapter. Uh, it really brought Gebser to mind. I, I really would love Ed Ed's take on this because Ed is a a, a Gebser geek, um, and I was really getting a, a sense of what Gebser calls the you know, time freedom uh, in in Aurobindo's um, description of these three modes of time. Uh, so this is yeah. I mean, one thing I'd last thing I'd like to say is. As I was reading the second chapter, I finally got the sense that, oh, he could go on doing this forever. <laughs> it, it just dawned on me that I wasn't going to get the complete finished understanding at any point, that this was much more the nature of a dance. And it was a dance of a logic because Nirguna Brahman relates to Saguna Brahman in a certain way. And those are aspects of you know, the supreme existent in a certain way. And there's a person aspect to it, but also an impersonal. And you could take all of these facets and even more that, you know, this is just the Vedantic tradition, right? It doesn't even include, you know, the, the Neoplatonic or 
uh, you know, various other indigenous modes of referring to these ultimate realities. Uh, but I think that when I'm reading this and resonating with it, it's like I'm feeling that ultimate, like that ultimate reality space, and then all the different ways that it can show up and then combine. And that there's a certain logic in that, which uh, I think if you, well, uh, it makes things make sense at those subtle levels. Uh, and that's all I have to say. And I think for modern physicists, also Gebser, um, and maybe it's something Eric Weiss said, I, I remember him talking about the modern mind and how it deals with previous structures like the magical and the mythical and uh, especially these subtle experiences. Um, you know, how a mythical consciousness would operate very differently by these significant others that em emerge and uh, might, you know, there's a need to surrender to a higher energy, but you don't want to surrender to something that's malevolent or, uh, you know, could possess you. So those are the things that previous structures were very uh, interested in. And he was, and I think Orbindo comes with a modern mind and he's operating in those subtle realms and he's confronting the same kind of phenomena, but I think he's interpreting it or using it, this capacity for perspective which the modern mind it brings brings to every occasion. But I think he doesn't get trapped in that, in the modern, uh, into, into the mental structure. I think he gets, he's very flexible with it. Uh, and I, I think he, he's sort of warning people, you know, as did Gebser, about uh, the mental structure can be very deceptive if it, if it tries to deny or ignore or sweep under the rug these anomalies. So I think that's what we're in the tension of right now as modern and postmodern people. How, what is our relationship to this subtle stuff? And I think we can do a great service to ourselves and to our communities if there are enough of us who are paying attention to the questions we ask, because that is going to change the field. Our relationship to the field is changing through our participation and observation of it. And I think that's what Gebs are saying is the, is the new, new thing that... Uh, can happen in the interval as we move towards that capacity to let go of the deficient forms of the mental, but embrace the healthy forms of the mental without denying the previous structures. And there, there are some people, I, I know this is a huge debate, there are some people saying they're, they're second tier and third tier and, you know, um, and, there, and there's some people like, I think Gebser didn't need all that. He said, well, you know, you already have mental you have archaic, you have magic, you have mythical, you have healthy mental, then the higher octave is integral. So I guess that's what we're all trying to sort out and read these, these texts to sort of see if we can get any guidance. It's very perplexing. Could, just quickly, I mean, it's just the way that you could surrender your soul to, you know, a, a demon at, at, the, at a mythical, in a mythical um structure of consciousness. I think you could surrender your mind to a logic in the mental structure of consciousness. And it could be a what Gebser would call a deficient logic or a malevolent logic or uh, That's right. And you can senseless. make this atomic bomb too. Right. Blow up millions of people guilt free. You know that's what we that, that's what we've done already. So yeah. Could I read a paragraph from a letter that ties into this? I can also perhaps link the whole thing, but there's just one paragraph that I'd like to share because it, it touches on a number of things we're talking about, including involution and evolution, but it's brought more, it's uh, the involution and evolution is given more explicitly in the two paragraphs that precede this. And I can send a, I can send a link to it also. He says, Sri Aurobindo says, but while the former steps in evolution were taken by nature without a conscious will in the plant and animal life, in man, nature becomes able to evolve by a conscious will in the instrument. It is not, however, by the mental will in man that this can be wholly done, for the mind goes only to a certain point and after that can only move in a circle. A conversion has to be made. 
a turning of the consciousness by which mind has to change into the higher principle. This method is to be found through the ancient psychological discipline and practice of yoga. In the past, it has been attempted by drawing away from the world and a disappearance into the height of the self or spirit. Sri Aurobindo, and he's using his name in the third person, Sri Aurobindo teaches that a descent of higher principle is possible, which will not merely release the spiritual self out of the world, but release it in the world, replace the mind's ignorance or its very limited knowledge by a supermental truth consciousness, which will be a sufficient instrument of the inner self and make it possible for the human being to find himself dynamically as well as inwardly and grow out of his still animal humanity into a diviner race. The psychological discipline of yoga can be used to that end by opening all parts of the being to a conversion or transformation through the descent and working of a higher still concealed supermental principle. I'll uh, send the link to that letter in the message in the chat. That's Thank exactly you. what I've been wanting to say. No. <laughs> There's quite a lot there. Who is Scarlet Fire? Scarlet Fire is the absent. Oh, there she is. That's me. I signed in from my phone, so uh, it's a different thing. I, I have to go, but I also, I invited Tony to the Savitri reading at the Berlin Center, but every year I get a group together at the Lodi Center and we, between Chinese New Year and Spring Equinox, and we read Savitri beginning to end and in a yurt. You all are, whoever wants is welcome to join. It's not really an open invitation event, but if anyone's interested, you can definitely ping me and I can let you know when the, when it comes up. And uh, I, yeah, the, the, we have a, a, a meeting every year. The, the Integral Yoga has a meeting every year. This year it's in New York. It's called an OM, All USA meeting. And uh, I'll be in upstate New York for that meeting next week. So I won't be able to join. And I'll see you all in two weeks. I have to scoot now for another meeting. Mateo? Yeah. Send me a message to that link, okay? I, uh, there is, it's not an, the Berlin center. It's not an open invitation. You, uh, can you email me or I can, I can type my email you here too. Send me a message through the forum, infinite conversations. Here's my email thing. There we go. Okay. I'll... Au revoir everyone. Choose. Bye. Bye. See you. See you in two weeks. Bye. Bye. Um, I have a question to the group, and uh, it concerns um, um, individuality and, um, you know, kind of the incommensability of, you know, personal experience and, um, you know, of things that make people unique in relationship to, you know, Aurobindo. In the last uh, call, uh, Debashish Banerjee, he said something like uh, he uh, traveled to Europe and then he traveled to India. And um, he uh, noticed that the people in India, they were much less, um, you know, had much less of a personal space. There was, there was much less weight to the person. So they weren't as much individualized as people, let's say, in Europe or in 
USA, Canada, you know, first world countries. And I would like to know, um, I mean, one critique of um, this uh, Aurobindian conception is that he was writing in an era where he wanted to have a system of everything. So he wanted to have, you know, from the prior oneness to the absolute oneness, and he wanted to have everything in one system. And, you know, everyone as a person is somewhere placed in that, in that system. And there's a tendency to overlook or overwrite the individuality of personal expression and, you know, kind of the things that make a person unique, right? So in Europe and in the Western world, we had the printing press and we had the enlightenment and, you know, people probably um, for hundreds of years, um, they had language and they rubbed their minds, so to speak, against those words and concepts and a greater degree of personality, of personal um, uniqueness came out. And, you know, there, were much, there was a greater depth to the person. I mean, there were people who were writing books, writing novels, and you could see, yes, so, I mean, this person, this, it's, it's not just a, some human being in the group. He, he or she has something unique to say, unique to tell. And then there were people who were kind of going way beyond that, like a Shakespeare or someone like that, who not, not just, you know, he, he wasn't just capable of telling his story, but, but you know, taking a, a perspective that went beyond and, you know, he could write about uh, different stories and different people and different epochs and could bring things together in a way that really, you know, wasn't there before. And so India and Europe, they haven't individualized as much as we have. And um, so the question is, um, is there a tendency maybe in the work of Sri Aurobindo that just, you know, it, overlooks the individuality of people and also like the things that happen in a person's life. It, it could be something like someone learns how to uh, play a musical instrument. I mean, you could have this experience of absolute oneness and, you know, primordial oneness. You, you don't get this with, um, with uh, you know, any any experience of the absolute. And, you know, is, is there a tendency to, you know, not, not, not really, um, you know, grasp this uh, uniqueness of, of people? Uh, Tony? That's, my, that's yeah. my question to the group. Yeah, may I make a question to you. Did, did you read The Human Cycle of Sri, Sri Aurobindo or um, well, uh, The Ideal of Human Unity? It's really the only books of Sri Aurobindo okay. that, that I read is, are those three volumes and I'm reading this, them for the first time. Okay. Uh, um, no, but because I think that he answers these questions um, in these in these books in his, his works that he has done, there he elaborates on the principle of the individuality that stands on one side and the well final supra cosmic reality and all the levels in between and how they relate to each others and reflect each others in. Uh, in the social social psychology of the yes. human race. Yes. So, so, so it's, a, yeah. You know, one other way to look at this is just to take every person as its own, maybe its own cosmos, you know? Yeah. And, you know, there are maybe things that are incommensurable. And, you know, when you go to the higher minds, 
you <laughs> remerge in a sense with everything and you know you're you're merged with everything at the lower mind and in between the higher and the lower is somewhere seems to be a complexity and something of a uniqueness that i think maybe gets lost i don't know so mm. i don't know if she addresses this. I didn't, i'm not sure if i understand what if i understand what you mean um I think at the level of the human mind, let's call it lower mind, if you wish, uh, there is an opposition uh, which uh, stru is struggling between the necessities of the individual and the equal important necessities of the coll collective. Mm -hmm. uh, on one side, you, you can see this also in politics, for example, on one side, You, uh, politics is something that works for the wealth and the well-being should. <laughs> It's not so, but should um, work for the um, well-being of the collective and very frequently uh, forgets the necessities of the individual who is also unique and uh, is a soul growing. Uh, it is a growing, so every one of us is a growing soul which, however, frequently comes in conflict uh, with the needs of the collective well-being. And this there is a contradiction and it is a struggle only if you look at it from the lower mind level. If you go up to the intuitive mind level or higher mind level, uh, you see that these two aspects, I, I'm, I'm trying to explain what Sri Aurobindo Uh, uh, wrote in, especially in the idea of human unity and the human cycle, where he writes what the social psychology of the masses and the individual is from the perspective of, from, of a higher consciousness. And he says practically that this is only an apparent uh, contradiction and contraposition between the needs of me, of myself, and the needs of a larger social aggregate. If we make a only a little step, and I think humanity is going to do this now, just you just look at the process of globalization, the, um, the internet and all these things, you can see that This is a, less, a lesson that we are uh, um, learning now, and this is favoring a higher mind perspective of society as a whole. Um, and, and there you can reconnect this apparent contradiction, which is it's not a contradiction, but it, it looks like a contradiction only at a mental level if you go up a little bit higher. It, you can see that this. I, and I, if I understand Tony correctly, I think he's saying something just a little bit different, not so much mm -hmm. that uh, we have to get beyond the conflict between the interests of the individual and the interests of the collective, but rather that we haven't, uh, or this tradition hasn't always sufficiently or adequately appreciated what it is to be a unique individual and the sort of irreducibility of that. Uh, there's a formulation you find in Kant that I think expresses this beautifully, where he distinguishes between uh, the price of something and the worth of something. So something has a price if it can be exchanged for something of the same price without any loss in value. Uh, that's true of pots and pans and so on and so forth, uh, mass-produced objects. Uh, but something has worth or dignity if there's nothing it can be exchanged for without the loss of value, and that is the case with individuals. And I think that's what we mean when we say that each individual is unique, right? Um, the, the disappearance of any individual will be, will be the disappearance of something that never existed before and will never exist again. And um, I, I don't know, you know, if you see the individuals just as types of beings, or just as members of a certain class of possible being. That's sort of an individual in maybe a kind of a numerical sense. 
but it's not it's not what we mean by individual in this kind of more existential sense. Um, if you see what, what I mean, I mean you, maybe you could just say, Tony, if that's if that harmonizes yes, with think. what we're getting at. Yeah. What you're, what you're saying. Yes, I think uh, I pretty much agree that you know something gets lost in the way you um, try to describe it with um, with Kant. Um, you know, it, it is the value of a human being, but it's also, um, I think there are certain types of experiences people make in their life that really are, I mean, you could describe them with your words, but they don't, they don't fit. It's not the same. It's not the same. You know, there are so many, so many specifics to, um, um, a person, not, not necessarily a person. It could also be, um, it could also be, um, you know, a group of people who, you know, does things or learns things in time. And, um, Yes, I mean, it's there are those aspects that are irredu irreducible. And if you look at them at the higher minds, you're just kind of saying they're more or less worthless. So I agree on this. I think maybe a good metaphor or analogy would be how a movie is made. Um, you have hundreds and hundreds of individuals with their own expertise um, doing their thing to make something happen. So with, with Aro Bindo, he, I don't really know if he could be considered the director, the producer, or just some other being within the process, but he, he takes, not necessarily takes for granted, but he takes into account and goes, goes cosmic mm -hmm. on us. He goes to those, that scale. So I think that Marco said it right, that, that this is one, one feature in a 20, 30 volume collected works that, that only addresses not necessarily one aspect, but it, it's um, not fully there. Um, and other people have noted, um, Banerjee has noted in one of his books, the, the complete diving into your individual self through even in the mother thinking about each individual cell as being something out there in the world or your own cosmos. Um, even what we're doing here, John presented us with his individual take to start out our second session on the, the second um, part of this book. And it's led to this conversation, but collectively, um, we've had individuals each lead out a specific um, perspective, and that's the the Western mind. That's the the individual oomph that we have, the individual um, greatness, which might be taken for granted or neglected in the Eastern traditions. Um, but at the same time, I, I, I don't know where I'm going with this at this point, but we're we're kind of an example of that right now. If that makes any sense. Probably doesn't answer your question, but <laughs> in a roundabout way, maybe it does. I would love to respond, but I don't want to respond if Kim has something to say. I do, but I don't know okay. if it's really that interesting. But um, I was thinking, I, I heard Tony say something, and I'm not sure I heard it right or the way that he meant it, but it made me think of, um, uh, I was in the Redwoods last week, and um, there was this really interesting feature about those trees, um, a lot of different things, but one thing in particular that stood out that I think sort of place what he was talking about like the way that higher mind might look at the individual and sort of discount it in some way um from that my, that level or whatever and i was thinking of in the forest there was these massive redwoods and many 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 of them um had this interesting feature called a fairy ring which was actually a lot of other redwoods that had grown out from the original tree 
And in many cases, the original tree had been obliterated, like the core, like this massive, you know, tree was no longer in existence, but like it was surrounded by all of these other fairy trees that were from its original growth. And it was like, it would be kind of dumb of the universe, like if there was some, some particular function of an individual that was sort of core to the emergence of the whole, that if like that, you know, trunk or whatever, for whatever reason, didn't survive or emerge in the way like that it was so important that it was sort of like holding the rest of us back or holding the rest of the emergence back. So I, even though there's like a specialness and a uniqueness or something like particularly interesting, like it was just amazing to me that in many cases, these massive trees in the core didn't survive, but there was still something there. Um, whether it was a hole in the forest floor where they didn't have any fairy trees, but these ones with the fairy trees kind of, I don't know why it made me think of, what he was saying that like, even though there was something that, that wasn't there, it was still like different because it had been there. And um, I don't know what, what I'm talking about. It made sense when it popped through my head. I'm not sure it does anymore though. <laughs> but um, yeah, like I don't understand Tony, the assumption that something viewed from higher mind is somehow less significant or that's implied in Aurobindo's work. Cause I don't get that out of his work at all. If I heard you at all correctly the, when you said it. I, I think I could provide like an, a, maybe a new example to illuminate what I think Tony means, but I also am aware that we're kind of near the end of our time and <laughs> heard from who may want to offer something. So I want to give some space to that and, uh, and, and then maybe after that I, I could, um, share my example. You know, I, uh, just very quick, I uh, traveled a little bit in my life. I was once in the Middle East and, um, you know, and then I went back to Germany and, um, you know, I think there really is a difference in the way people see themselves and, um, you know, one person once said that, um, you know, people in the West are kind of a gift to humanity because they are those, they have those big personalities and those, they are so much individualized, you know, it's kind of something totally different, you know, it's very, um, like, imagine you live somewhere in the third world, and, you know, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, some, I don't know, caste systems. I mean, they don't really exist anymore. But, I mean, you see through television or through the internet, those highly individualized people. I mean, there's something different, something um, like emergent in um, uh, the coming into being of, uh, um, you know, individuals that you know and i think it's not it's not it's not as much present in uh, third world countries second world countries like uh like india and um that that's that's a good thing so. i i think what tony's articulating is at least in my world um a pretty standard understanding of what makes Western civilization distinctive, not necessarily better or worse, but certainly uh, distinctive. Um, not to be pedantic, but I can recommend a fairly recent and interesting book on the subject by a guy named Larry Seidentop called Inventing the Individual. Uh, he traces the roots back to uh, sort of early Christianity not primitive Christianity, but the first few centuries, well, the beginning around the fourth, fifth centuries um, after the common era. Um, so I don't know, in my world, this is uh, kind of taken for granted. That this is what makes the West distinctive for good, for bad, for neutral. I'm just aware that India is a democracy though, and there seems to be a strong amount of pro-democratic uh, de movement in India that would be even um, 
less corrupt than what we're seeing in the West, certainly than what we're seeing in the U.S. Um, with the kind of overrunning of big money uh, and, you know, large organizational structures really rendering that ideal of the West um, not really happening uh, at the moment, at least in America. Whereas in India, um, you know, there's a million people signed up for um, direct democracy uh, with smartphone and blockchain powered um, and, you know, 200 candidates being trained uh, next month. Um, and at this point, I'm not seeing that in the U.S. or Canada. So I guess there's always this possibility of, of leapfrogging. You know, we might, see a <laughs> we might see China or India leapfrog us in certain ways, um, depending how we respond uh, in the West or in North America to our current circumstances. Well, one thing about what um, uh, Devashish said last week, I had a slightly different sort of take on uh, his emphasis. Um, I think he was making a generalization around certain cultures. Um, but you notice he used words like there's like a sense of something being different. So he was also talking about like an aesthetic or a feeling that he had literally of like how different places feel differently. And I think he was describing that felt difference to that particular um, maybe um, ego sort of dimension, right? And, and the reason I think that's relevant is, I mean, I have that sense when I'm on a plane sometime that I'm flying into a city. I mean, I have a different physical like uh, feeling of like the place that I'm entering into whether I'm over water or whatever, it's like I just have a, a sense of feeling something a little bit different. And I imagine, John, you have these types of, you know, experiences consciously as well. And I think we're all having these, whether or not we're sort of conscious of our different architecture, right, our physical body, our energetic bodies, our different, you know, bodies, to the extent that people on this call have those actual direct experiences with different dimensions, you know, and that's where logic, I would think, is limiting for me or certain ways of talking about things unless it's a shared experience that you can all point to in the concrete it's hard to have an exchange and agree on it when there's these other dimensions that that sort of emerge um so i think you know i feel a little bit sort of sort of stuck in terms of contributions even in this conversation because when john asked us to articulate our experience uh earlier of you know think of three things okay what's most important how do you know it why you know and these sort of questions um you know just my felt sense of the experience was like you know it was actually very painful to just sit with you guys um initially in the conversation and i felt my sacrum was like getting stabbed and i had like my chest was very tight and the back of my head feels like my spinal column got ripped out of my you know uh back of my head so like I mean but it was very subtle but it was very uncomfortable and so like to articulate the fact that it was like physically uncomfortable to sit in the space is sort of like an irrelevant commentary but it was my experience and then to draw pictures for that or try and interpret it in some way which I really appreciated Marco doing and also sort of Douglas sharing um you know just sort of abstract sort of um uh, or some sort of representation of that experience but like I, I find myself, you know, having a felt sense for something or some sort of kinesthetic or subtle energy experience or whatever you want to call it, sensitivity to an architecture. A lot of those things, when you talk about Orobindo, he talks about bringing the subconscious conscious and the conscious subconscious and like kind of like how much sort of fluidity do you have around sort of where you're orienting from and talking from and where do you share and then where do you relate to others? You know, there's a lot of other things happening in the Aurobindo reading and all these other things that we could be sort of, you know, sharing experiences on, but the limitation is the fact that we don't, you know, how do you have a shared language for that? You know, you can kind of guide someone into an experience with you in a certain sort of setting, but in this sort of context, I feel like we're just trading ideas and some concepts and that's a little bit, um, you know, it's interesting to me, but it's sort of like not, nearly as full and rich as what he's really pulling out um, for me when I read his work. So um, I think you have to look at um, this a lot of different ways, but like, I, I think it's 
hard for me to respond to you, Tony, when I hear, you know, Debussy's talking about something and I'm really kind of keying into the, the sensory sort of sense that he's talking about and all the dimensions that are there that are never even brought in in the conversation. So um, I, I feel like I'm struggling a little bit to contribute a, a lot more than just to acknowledge that that's my own sort of maybe frustration and limitation with even articulating some of these uh, responses that you guys are bringing up with your questions and observations. Cause I feel like there's a, the other dimensionality that we're not even touching. What would happen if we did touch those other dimensions? I mean, I don't think we can help but do it, but I guess the question is, is how do we inter interact in for sort of that intersubjective or interior, like how do we even, what does it look like? I mean, I'm sure we are, right? But what is the, what, what emerges from that? Or what is it to do that? You know, we can share symbols, right? Like, and we can interpret Marker's drawing. And I, there was a few things in it that made me smile because I have some specific things in my own sort of psyche floating around that sy symbolically, I'm like, oh, shoot, wow, was he like in my head today, you know? But, you know, and, and, and then it's like, how do we have a conversation about that? You know, that's not just sort of like, you know, devolving into chaos. And that's the end of our call. <laughs> Devolving into chaos. <laughs> well, um, I think individuality might have something to do with it. I, 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 like you had an experience that you didn't share. And not that you should or shouldn't have shared it necessarily, but um, uh, maybe it was, maybe it would have been relevant. Like maybe, it, maybe that individual experience or the performance of the experience would, um, like in Doug's movie, like add something to the overall production, you know, like. when Tony brought up his point, which I think from the critical theory perspective is, or the civil study of civilizations perspective is um, uh, like more obvious. Uh, I think that from another perspective, which is more in this, these spiritual discourses, there is a tendency to suppress individuality uh, because there's the striving for the aspiration towards uh trans personality, trans individuality, or some kind of higher thing. Uh, Aurobindo says this too, that there needs to be a surrender to the higher mind of, of the individual, by the individual, in order to let that, um, I guess in order you know, to participate in its individuality. So there's a, it has its own, but it's not other than our own or one's own. So. So there's some, I think, tension there between these different spaces or discourses or cultural spaces you know, where like to, to be who you are in the most idiosyncratic, weird way is more or less encouraged. I think it's complicated, too, by the fact that individuality is commodified. So in the West, to be an individual is really could be as simple as that your consumer choices and the unique kind of configuration of your brands that you prefer or what have you. And I think that's the, that there's a certain logic that wants to individualize us in order to capitalize upon us. Um, and, and that's where I think it becomes like the inquiry deepens because there's the question of, like, can we go beyond that into a, into a, a bigger logic? Uh, like when uh, I thought of William, the, the cultural question, I, I, I thought of like any literature. I mean, there's so many unique authors, writers, poets uh, that 
um, manifest an experience that is completely novel. Like, um, I thought of William Burroughs for some reason, Naked Lunch. If we read his text, like a paragraph, I, I was going to do it. I don't think I should do it. But it's so off the wall. It's so nothing like what should be found in any kind of spiritual context. But where else would it arise except where it arose? And there's something of the cosmic being in this text. But this text doesn't reduce to a con concept of the cosmic being, which would come out of a philosophical text. So um, I think it all makes sense. I'm just reminded of the mother and our Obindo and how incredibly different they were from one another. They were nothing alike. She went out and started the society and she planted flowers and she did all kinds of things relating to the lives of the cells and that kind of experience. And Aurobindo was more somebody that sat in his room and, and experienced all of the things he experienced. But Aurobindo, one thing that I respect so much about Aurobindo and the mother is that they both seem to be constantly in reciprocity with one another. And be, by doing that, they were each more whole. And I, I respect that so much. And I feel that, that uh, you know, questioning the way that we engage in our conversations here is a good thing because maybe there are times for us to be giving our individual opinions and maybe there are times for us to be in reciprocity so that we can be more whole. So anyway, I know that it's about time to go here. It's 10 minutes after eight, but I thought I would just honor both of the conversations because I think both the collective and the individual are indispensable and, and the, the individual shares deeply with the, the rest of us, we all are better than who we were before. So I want to thank you all. I have to go now, but many blessings. Thank you. Well, I should go too. Last time we lingered, and then a whole nother conversation started. So, <laughs> the after conversation. I, I, I want that tonight. But, um, right, well, thanks everyone. Whoever wants thanks. to stay. Bye, guys. All right. Yeah. Thanks, John. Thank you for meeting, John. Yeah, thank yes, thanks. Bye, Good night. Bye, bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. See you next time. Bye -bye.